So let's start. So today it's going to be an interesting and jam-packed, uh, interesting uh, webinar. We have a lot of uh, demos waiting, and also we have an interesting customer use case uh, to be shared as well. So please stay tuned. So here we are talking about more Kafka and ClickHouse, the most uh, interesting combination. And we wanted to jump deep into like all the technical integrations and uh, to learn more about like what type of methods that we can choose for more real-time analytics and uh, what are the benefits, pros and cons. So let's jump into it. So here's our agenda. So we have uh, integration methods of ClickHouse and Kafka and some of the use cases where this type of scenarios or the combinations of used. And yeah, we have the interesting demo of each of this integration method. And last is our interesting use case on our customer plot line. They are here to share our their success story on how they managed to use these combinations uh, within their ecosystem. So before we start, a little bit introduction about ourselves. Myself, Deepan, I'm a senior product manager here in Double Cloud, responsible for all the product roadmaps and also the features that's planned within Double Cloud. Uh, Andre, over to you. Yes, and I'm Andre. I'm a tech lead in Double Cloud. I will uh, today demo and give some more integration capabilities. Uh, Amit, you want to introduce us? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Amit, and I work at Plotline. It's a small startup, and uh, currently. I'm handling all the tech side of things. Thanks, Amit. So, yeah, stay tuned. So, we'll hear more about uh, the use case and demo in the upcoming slides. So, before we proceed, like quick intro or a word about Double Cloud. So, Double Cloud is a platform to build end to end analytics uh, infrastructure using services like ClickHouse, Kafka, and also AdFlow. So, it's, it, it's a platform where you can just spin up all the things right from the data ingestion until the visualization. So we have different services or components for cluster management, for ETL services, we have transfer and also for the visualization to build dashboards, we have a visualization service. So everything in one single platform. So we can just spin up within just a few clicks and then everything is ready to go. And it's also available in AWS and GCP and Azure is still in progress. So stay, stay tuned, we'll hear more about it. <clears throat> so before we proceed, so where are this type of combinations quite widely seen? This Kafka and ClickHouse. So mostly this type of combinations of ClickHouse and Kafka is widely seen in like uh, clickstream scenarios or like we wanted to see some scenarios where um, like uh, on our customers use case plot line is like app analytics and also like in IoT sensors, like where you wanted to ingest data from different IoT sensors and take some actions on top of it, or you wanted to build some real-time analytics out of the sensor data that's coming out of IoT sensors so that you can run for like predictive maintenance or any other such use case. And last is also more about like observability, where all these logs and uh, monitoring logs are coming from different uh, topics of Kafka and then pushed into ClickHouse for more faster querying and observable ticket. Uh, and then later on, the dashboards are built on top of ClickHouse. So these are like widely seen scenarios where this combination of Kafka and uh, ClickHouse is quite widely seen. So before we, uh, let's click, kick into a slide, Andre. Yep. Uh, so why it's actually matter to have something uh, uh, in combination with a ClickHouse, uh, mostly because a ClickHouse is uh, uh, analytical database, and most of analytical database has uh, performed some trade-offs in terms of uh, 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 speed of uh, querying, speed of writing, etc. In a ClickHouse, you need to think about and know about uh, one particular thing, which is uh, how the data structured inside of a ClickHouse. That's actually a reason why it's sometimes hard to write directly in a ClickHouse. Uh, the data structure in a ClickHouse uh, combined from a parts, and each part later will be merged to a bigger part. That's why ClickHouse can perform query fast because uh, the part itself is a columnar data structure on a disk or in a tree, uh, which quite easy to uh, perform analytics based on a column. And uh, the reason why it can be performed if we have a big part, each big part is easier to analyze rather than small uh, a, a big chunk of a small part. And the ClickHouse itself, when you try to write to a ClickHouse, you create for each query the part. 
and each query in each new query creates this part and then this part will should merge together in a bigger pad and those process of merging parts is infinite process on the background of a clickhouse work and if you write in a clickhouse directly with a smaller queries uh, you will probably face uh, too many parts to merge error after like couple hours of uh, of uh, of running a clickhouse. Clickhouse love to uh, write inside of a, if 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 someone write to a clickhouse in a big part batches. Bigger batch is a better for a clickhouse. Uh, if you write uh, like a one gigabyte per insert, clickhouse would be happy with that. And that's why it's sometimes quite hard to write to a clickhouse. And that's why the having some sort of a buffer solution uh, before a clickhouse is a go to for for a bigger workloads. Go next. Yeah. So uh, that's why we uh, talk about Kafka plus ClickHouse integration. The Kafka is a perfect buffer, perfect message bus to uh, aggregate message before landing it to uh, all up storage to a ClickHouse. And the Kafka plus ClickHouse integration is uh, essential. There is several uh, capabilities how you can integrate it, but uh, let's firstly outline what exact is integration about. First, integration is split into three wide uh, main stages, uh, and all of the stages um, have a different uh, attributes. Like reading stage is more about EO operation with a Kafka and uh, mostly EO bound process. Transform process is. Uh, uh, transformation process is about parsing. You re read some raw data from a Kafka. It's usually like just a byte array. And you need to make from it something structural to write to a ClickHouse. ClickHouse is a structured database. So you have to parse your data from a Kafka somehow and, and then lend it to a ClickHouse. And the last stage is a writing stage. It's also EO bound process, but EO right now, uh, in the ClickHouse site. So we have a three different kind of a process, a reading stage EO bound for Kafka, trans transformation stage is a CPU bound process and writing stage is EO bound to a ClickHouse. All of the stays is uh, spend some resources and actually integration uh, a mechanism is uh, choosing right integration mechanism to you is mostly about choosing a right trade-off between uh, where to put those resource spending. Uh, you you can uh, based on your workload decide to choose different uh, location. Go next one. So uh, there is a three main methods. Uh, there is actually more, but we just highlight three of them because this is a like big group of methods. First one is a Kafka engine. Kafka engine is a built-in capabilities of a ClickHouse to ingest data. In this scenario, you put all three stages, parsing, uh, reading, and writing in a database itself, in a ClickHouse itself. And uh, that's uh, the way to ingest everything from, side, from inside of a ClickHouse, inside of a ClickHouse. This is like self... Uh, 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 self-contained solution. The second option is a Kafka Connects. It's pretty similar to a ClickHouse. The only difference here is that we move away from a ClickHouse, this workload, like reading, parsing, and writing, to a Kafka itself. Instead of a Kafka, there is a process that read Kafka topic and parse it, this data and then write to a ClickHouse. So those uh, workload hosted inside of a Kafka. And third option is external writer. When you have an external writer, you out... Uh, um, move this uh, read, parse, and write process outside of your boss database, Kafka and the ClickHouse, and, uh, and run it somewhere else. So these three groups of uh, integration methods are mostly about uh, dealing with your resources spending uh, and uh, to write, choose based on, you should choose right based on your workload. Let's go to the next one. So let's uh, take a look closely to a Kafka engine method. The Kafka engine method is a basically a, a set of a tables inside of a ClickHouse. You have to create a, a chain of a tables. ClickHouse have a very nice capabilities of materialized view. So, uh, and the external tables view. So in ClickHouse, you can specify a Kafka table engine, which is a special kind of a table that can connect to a Kafka. Then you create a materialized view to parallel those data from a Kafka table engine. And then you create a, a merge tree family or any other kind of uh, uh, 
table that will finally land your data in a ClickHouse. So those three sta uh, stages actually is our read, parse, and push uh, stages uh, specified as a uh, ClickHouse tables. So uh, uh, stop talking. Let's stop talking about the boring stuff and start uh, doing a demo. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think you see my screen, right? Yep, I, I, I think so. So I already create a cluster of a Kafka in a double cloud and a cluster of a Kafka of a click house in a double cloud. So we have it two clusters. I did that with a Terraform code. So I can uh, uh, recreate it quite easily. And also inside of a Terraform, we have a nice capabilities to passing uh, the credentials of a Kafka to a click house. It's done by simply specifying the configuration model. Here is an example of a code, how to create a click house cluster. Uh, and in the, inside of this code, we pass uh, uh, authorization mechanism for our Kafka. So we uh, don't have to uh, do anything extra on, with, with those uh, Kafka and a ClickHouse instances. I also uh, expose this instance to myself, to my local API addresses, so I can access it locally. And um, so let's connect to our ClickHouse cluster. So I, I actually already connected to it. So as you can see, I'm in this ClickHouse cluster. Uh, and this is our entry point. We need to create a set of a tables. There is an example table for me. So first we need to create a queue wrapper, our topic wrapper around the Kafka. So uh, inside of a Kafka topic, we have a settings about uh, format of a data. Uh, format of data, we will use JSON and show. I already prepare a topic. Uh, inside of this topic, there is a JSON messages, JSON line messages with three fields, user test, ID, and message. So we will create a table that will read this data from a Kafka in the JSON natural format and uh, parse these three columns. So we need to specify a Kafka host here. Let me copy paste it from a UI. So clusters, Kafka cluster, and the hero connection string. So I will copy paste it here and we'll apply it to my ClickHouse cluster. So I create a table called demo events queue. But as you can see, I can select anything from those, this table because it's a queue, it's not a real table. That's because it's a queue, the query is not allowed. That's why we need the next two stages. The next two stages is creating a landing table. The landing table is what you actually will query with your data. This table, I call it the events table, it contains the same columns, but I uh, decided to parse user TS as a date M64. And also I wanted to add some technical columns about what is a data from a Kafka itself, a topic of set partition and Kafka timestamp. Those three columns uh, uh, also can be useful for later analysis uh, what came from a, from a Kafka. So let's create this. Uh, table in a click house. So I create a table called demo events table. Let's select something from it. As you can see, I wrote the right of form. As you can see, it's empty. That's so reasonable because we have uh, just the two table, one for Kafka engine, another one for landing data, but there is no connection between them. So to create such connection, we should create our delivery pipeline. Those delivery pipeline is materialized view. The materialized view is a thing that will trigger insert of the, of the events from uh, demo events queue to a demo events table. And also you can specify on those level, on materialized view level, some extra uh, parsing rules. So this is an example, how to parse data. So I took the user timestamp, which is originally a string, as you can see here, a string, and called the special function from a click house, parse data and best effort. It tried to parse it in a datem 64 and I also specify a time zone to UTC. So this column will be parsed on a, on a runtime uh, in a real time and uh, uh, put it to a 
uh, UTC time zone. Also, I took this uh, four magical columns, topic of setting partition with an underscore. This is a magical columns that exist in every Kafka engine tables. There is a couple more, but I took only this four. Uh, there is uh, for many Kafka and many ClickHouse tables, there is so-called uh, ephemeral columns that you can use uh, for your own it. And I use here just this four. So let's create this materialized view. So once materialized view created, uh, the the process should spin up. You have a, your uh, topic, you have your table, you have materialized view. All this should come together. And let's see the data actually landed in our demo events table. Table. I hope that it works. No, it's not works. It usually takes some time. And you can explore what's uh, going on in inside of a cluster by looking into logs. Yep, we have speech columns. We have something, something about Kafka storage, Kafka storage, Kafka. Yep, read rows, read rows. So it should work fine now. Not really. Okay, we should wait a couple couple of minutes small, but it should work at some point of time. Uh, you, there, there is a, I think I, I, I can wrap it up, but there is one particular problem, which you also see here with this uh, mechanism of in integration Kafka uh, with a ClickHouse inside of a ClickHouse. It's really hard to see what's going on inside because all thing is going in background. You can't see uh, much details about process. You can't see about much uh, information about what's going on. Maybe something wrong, maybe something not parsed. All of this uh, information exists only inside of a logs of a click house. So uh, you can't see this quite well. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, so there is uh, uh, of this uh, mechanism, there is a pros and cause. The pros here is that it's pretty simple. You don't need to set up anything else. Also, if your ClickHouse cluster is underutilized, you can also utilize more same resources for different workload inside of a ClickHouse. So you shouldn't, you have no, uh, need to spend extra money for extra resources for parsing and pushing your data to a click house. But meantime, there is uh, some cons, cons here. First of all, first of all, the observability and the visibility. This process is hidden from you. So you have to do some uh, manual works inside of a click house queries to understand what's going on. And if something went wrong, the only possible way to explore the problems is going to the click house logs. Uh, and also another thing you should also uh, be careful here, the same resource utilization is a double-edged sword. On one side, you have no need to new uh, resource in your resource pool, but other problem here is a scalability concern. If your ClickHouse is under heavy load, the ClickHouse would uh, probably uh, put your delivery pipeline on a on a, uh, it will depreciate your delivery pipeline because ClickHouse always to choose uh, to serve real-time queries over the delivery pipeline, and you can uh, see unpredictable uh, uh, data uh, lake between ClickHouse and uh, Kafka because ClickHouse under heavy load. Another problem is a problem with the corrupt data. If your data in a Kafka by some reason is corrupted, it's really hard in a ClickHouse to uh, pass pass but this data, uh, there is so so called concept dead letter queue. When you uh, have a special table or uh, landing location for data, which is can be parsed like corrupted data. In some real world scenarios, if you have a Kafka, as a, inside of Kafka, you have a you you can have a probability of uh, possibility of uh, corrupted data. And in ClickHouse, there is no uh, built in capabilities to postpone this. Uh, corrupted data on and put it on some on on some side. So you have to do this manually. You have to read manually upset in a Kafka and moving this upset uh, to to uh, go through this corrupted data. So this is main pros and cons of Kafka engine uh, methods. Uh, let's go to the next one. So the next one is an external writer. Uh, inside of a double cloud, we have the such as external writer, but 
To be honest, there is a, a plenty on the market as well. They look pretty similar. In this uh, example, we put one more entity in our architecture. We have a producer, we have a Kafka, and between a Kafka and a ClickHouse, we have a transfer. The transfer is a se separate process hosted not inside of a ClickHouse and not inside of a Kafka on the separate resources, which read data from a Kafka, parse it, and then push it to a ClickHouse. Such processes are uh, usually called as external writer. And in this scenario, read, parse, and push are actually handled outside. Uh, I also prepared a demo for this. Let me show my screen one more time. Uh, I use, again, the demo with a Terraform. Where is my Terraform? Here is my Terraform. So I already create a transfer from a Terraform. That uh, in a in a transfer you specify pretty much the same thing as you done in a in a Kafka stream engine uh, specification. You need to specify a format of your data. So I create uh, a transfer endpoint. This transfer endpoint uh, took a Kafka source for the specific cluster, and it was raised with an administration user. And also, we should specify so-called parser. The parser is how we read data and make it structured. First, you need to specify a format. In our case, it's a JSON. And then you specify a fields. What kind of a fields you will see in the landing table. Uh, in this case, it's the same three fields, user test, ID, and the message. And in this case, I actually specify the type as a data already. So it will be parsed as a date and created as a date column in the click house. Also, you should specify a, a topic. The same topic is our uh, in like, like in our Kafka stream engine example. So also, I need to create a, a transfer endpoint for target, but it's quite straightforward. You just specify a click house target connection. It's cluster ID and database and username, and then glue it together in a transfer entity. All this stuff is pretty straightforward and can be done either in a Terraform or via UI. So in UI, it looks uh, pretty uh, easy. You have like these two endpoints, click stream source with a cluster and conversion rules. It's actually a projection of my Terraform here. So this is my Terraform. And this is my uh, entity that's already created. And on the transfer side, I already uh, created and activated. We have a running transfer, which is uh, running for some time, and it's delivered a, a, a data. As you can see, the this is already delivered some some records with some bytes, and the transfer itself will deliver data and create table automatically. And table will would be inferred from a topic name. So in our click stream source or topic name is click house event. So in a click house, there should be a table called click house event. Let's see, show tables. So here are our click house events. Let's see how many rows we just already. So there is a hundred thousand rows already ingested, which is a uh, quite cool. And we can see that it's growing steadily from the time. And the main profits of such external writers is extended capabilities of uh, uh, vi extended visibility and observability for end users. So you can actually see what's going on. On, on this particular case, you can see the amount of rows written. It's, it's uh, had some delay actually. And you also have a monitoring, which can uh, which you can observe the data lakes, bytes written, bytes pushed, rows pushed, etc. Such uh, capabilities are really hard to achieve inside of a ClickHouse because a ClickHouse is a closed system. Uh, but uh, for external writer, it's much easier to uh, to see this. But there is uh, some drawbacks. Let's go back to the slides. Yep, let's go to the next one. So yeah, again, let's uh, recap our pros and cons. In the pros, uh, we have uh, dynamic scalability and enhanced visibility. Uh, for dynamic scalability, the main point here is that we uh, not share the same resources, but uh, externalize our resources for our delivery pipeline. So delivery pipeline can't affect your real-time 
uh, queries and can't affect your production. So you uh, have a security for that. Also, you can achieve the uh, constant uh, delivery lag. So even if your cluster under heavy load in terms of queries, you can still have uh, fresh data up in time. Another important thing here is automated offset, offset management. We, in, a, in, a, in, in, in most of the external writers and then transfer in a double cloud itself, you have a capability of so-called dead letter if some data is wrong, we just uh, uh, put it aside and continue or stop based on your uh, requirements. So it, it already automated. And another important thing for for external writers that is uh, uniquely just for for double cloud transfer, we actually support uh, the migrations. Uh, so if the data is uh, not static but evolving from a time, we will add the columns up for you in a ClickHouse automatically, and we will alter these columns for you uh, inside of a ClickHouse automatically. So you should you can. Uh, uh, minimize your efforts here. But here's another con, here's a uh, con side on this approach. Uh, the main problem here is you have to uh, deal with one more system in your pipeline. It's a transfer system. And uh, this system have to be set up somewhere. Uh, it can be easily automated if you use managed one. But also this uh, comes with a cost because you externalize your resources for delivery on different process and this process is cost something. It's not free. If you use uh, the delivery inside of a ClickHouse, you already have these resources inside of a ClickHouse. So you have no new resources introduced for delivery pipeline, but in external writer, you have extra resources. So these cons need to be uh, take, taken in mind. Uh, so, Andrew, Andrew, there's a question regarding external writer, like how many concurrent clients can be accepted in case of external writer? Is there any limits? Uh, the actually no limits. You can scale it in, infinitely. The the limitation here is a source in the target database. Usually, the limitation for source database is amount of partition in a Kafka. So, uh, based on in a, in, in a Kafka, when you read something from a Kafka, you have a unit of parallelization, which is a partition. So, having more external writers than you have a partition is a uh, excessive because some of those writers would read nothing. Uh, so uh, you can scale your external writers up to partition number for your uh, source. On the target side, it's more scalable because on a target, usually you have uh, no such thing as a partition, but you should consider the uh, total uh, throughput for, for target database for ClickHouse. Uh, based on the size of a ClickHouse, they can uh, lend more or less data because uh, the ClickHouse itself is also has their own uh, limits in terms of uh, of uh, uh, resources. Main resource uh, here that we should care about is a ClickHouse EO resources. It's network resources and disk resources. Disk is not directly involved here, but EO is directly involved here. So if you have, for example, a three nodes ClickHouse spin up somewhere, and this ClickHouse try to it, and you try to write like. Uh, one gigabyte per second data on this ClickHouse, you will probably face some issues because input uh, network for those nodes are limited and you actually can reach a network uh, throughput for ClickHouse on those nodes. So uh, you should uh, think about uh, your uh, limitation in terms of a database. The Such writers usually can scale infinitely. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, okay, so that was an interesting demo and uh, to learn more about like different methods of integration between Kafka and ClickUps. Let's hear more from our customer plotline. Uh, Amit, over to you to just explain a bit more on the use case and how Double Cloud helped. Uh, sure, Dipen, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Uh, so, hi, I'm Amit Agrawal. Um, I work at Plotline. Uh, at Plotline, we help product and growth teams uh, improve the metrics that matter to them by customizing in-app experiences uh, according to their users' behavior, right? Uh, and this can be, uh, they can create different onboarding and visual tools. They can uh, decide what particular element to show on basis of 
what activity the user performs or performed within previous three months and uh, uh, so uh, this is important because uh, these product and growth teams do not get a lot of engineering bandwidth right uh, for making customizations on the app so our app uh, integration takes around 15 to 20 minutes and then uh, our these teams can configure all these nudges on the dashboard and uh, uh, it will show uh, you can customize the content, the type of nudges, all those on basis of your user's behavior. Uh, similarly, we also have some gamification and different other components where you can also leave it to probability and then uh, you can also on basis of whatever cards, scratch card your user got, you can then uh, create a flow where you will then give the benefit to the user so how it works is uh, you would first design the campaign on our dashboard then you would define the user behavior like uh, in this example we have a user whose account creation happened at least once in last seven days and it had all these particular attributes so all those users who satisfy this criteria uh, whenever they perform a particular event they would see these nudges and we also have a mechanism of goal tracking so that you can do a b testing right you can define uh, that i want to show this to five percent of my users and then compare with the rest of 95 uh, how my goals are improving and on basis of that you can decide which particular campaign you would like to show to all the users to maximize your output so uh, so for all this to happen for tracking all the user activities uh, we we have to process a lot of events right and uh, so we had a legacy architecture where we got all these events from the api uh, Initially, we were writing it directly to BigQuery, but uh, due to the limits imposed by BigQuery, uh, we created this pipeline where we were writing it to a local file. Then we were forwarding it to uh, Firehose via a Firehose agent. This AWS Firehose delivered those events to an S3 file. And from there, our Lambda was picking it up and inserting it into BigQuery. So, we had a lot of aggregations at all these points. Now, uh, there were a few issues with this pipeline. So one is, uh, as we scaled, we hit different limits. Like we hit fire hose uh, limit where you can only insert a particular number of events every second. And then uh, all those rest of the events were getting throttled. Then uh, we hit the disk IOPS limit where uh, since we were writing so many events and then we were uh, reading so many events again, we were hitting our IOPS limit. Then during traffic spikes, uh, this system kind of behaved very erratically. And then uh, it was very difficult to scale it to the next year because when we were uh, at this particular architecture, we had around 2-3 million events every day. Uh, today, we are processing around 100 million events every day. And it is expected that in next 3 months, we would be processing around 500 million events. So, uh, at that scale, this architecture had a lot of bottlenecks. And uh, we were kind of stuck in a loop where we would fix one bottleneck and then we would encounter the next one. So uh, then uh, one more problem is, uh, so all of these aggregation steps had delays, right? When we write to the local file, Firehose agent will forward this in five seconds. Then fi at Firehose, uh, it, will it will aggregate one minute data and then deliver it into S3. Then the Lambda will pick it up 
uh, and uh, it will run every five minutes, collect all the ST files and insert into BigQuery. So all these aggregation steps caused a lot of delay in event sync to BigQuery. And because of that, we were not able to solve these really important in-moment use cases for our clients where they want to show a particular thing as soon as the user enters the segment and as soon as the user performs any activity. So uh, then since there are so many components, it, it was getting very difficult to monitor everything. Uh, so it things were breaking at a lot of different points and we were not able to understand why things are happening uh, quickly. And then there was a lot of cost efficiency, right? Because uh, so storage in BigQuery was uh, not a problem for us, but we were querying it a lot. And we had query based pricing in BigQuery where the more you query data, the more you have to pay. And so as our scale was in increasing, our cost was also linearly increasing. So we were not getting economies of scale also. And then uh, since uh, our entire stack was deliver, uh, deployed into AWS and this data was, uh, insert, we were inserting it into BigQuery, we were also paying the data transfer charges there. So we decided to uh, kind of experiment with other options that we have where we can create a stream which is uh, where we would not have to uh, we would not have to kind of do so much effort and then we are getting the same or at least a better cost optimization so uh, that's when we uh, created this new architecture we have an api of events which so we are inserting it the events directly into Kafka and then we have uh, like uh, we have this queue inside the clickhouse which is reading from Kafka and then we have a materialized view which is uh, inserting the events from that queue to the target table. Now um, so uh, this new architecture has solved a lot of our problems. One is uh, we can scale Kafka brokers horizontally and vertically also, uh, and it would, uh, it is very easy. It's just uh, making, clicking a few buttons on double clouds dashboard and you can handle 5x load without doing anything else. Then, uh, since this happens almost immediately, like there, there is around four or five seconds ka gap. So the data processing is also very fast and because of this we are able to unlock a lot of very important use cases for our customers then uh, uh, so since we have deployed both our kafka cluster and clickhouse cl cluster in double cloud there is no data transfer charge between kafka and clickhouse and uh, the price is also fixed and predictable because it does not linearly scale with how much query we run, uh, but we have estimated and like ClickHouse, uh, Stephen from ClickHouse also helped a lot in estimating the resource utilization and the best cluster size that we should go with to ensure that uh, our queries will run efficiently and then we are not uh, paying a lot by having a lot of buffer on top of our basic requirement uh, and it's very secure and it's very easy to maintain also because uh, like so in Kafka uh, you will get options to create topic in double cloud you will get options to handle the life cycle of messages as in how to compress it uh, what should be the time after which you have to delete it and all those uh, options are available on the dashboard we decided to <clears throat> so we were uh, we had to decide between hosting this cluster ourselves or going with a managed service so we decided to go with a managed service because of the reliability because there are so many people who are already using this so uh, 
it's and we also experienced after uh when we were in testing phase that the clusters are working very reliably and scaling it is very easy to use you don't need to uh, kind of have a lot of manual effort to do that then we don't need to spend a lot of time in maintaining it and then we also get uh, expertise of like uh, people who are managing clickhouse and kafka at double cloud so initially when we were processing five uh, three to five million events per day using BigQuery and the older architecture we kind of had uh, to pay 1200 to 1300 dollars uh, to BigQuery uh, other than that, we also had Lambda cost and then Firehose cost associated. So it was overall that architecture was uh, costing us somewhere around $2,000 for these many events. Today, we are processing 100 million events per day using our Kafka and ClickHouse cluster on Double Cloud. And our uh, total cost comes out somewhere around $1,400 where $1,100 is for our ClickHouse cluster and $300 is for our Kafka cluster. So this is also one reason why we chose to go with Kafka and Double Cloud. It's very cost effective. And then uh, integrating Double Cloud was very easy. We spent like half an hour creating the, uh, those tables and then uh, Whenever required, we also took help from Stephen and Luke, who are kind of our POCs in Double Cloud. And so uh, they are able to kind of reliably support us. Uh, there were instances where even in ClickHouse, we were storing uh, events in wrong format because of which we were using a lot of uh, storage space and storage space was becoming a concern for us. Uh, so we keep having these calls kind of every month or two months where we can just ping up about if we are facing any challenge and then they would help us. So Stefan help us in optimizing the way we are storing data where uh, so that it's better compressed and so uh, when we scaled from when we recently scaled from 50 million to 100 million events per day we did not have to scale anything in clickhouse and kafka so that is a reason why we uh, went ahead with double cloud and uh, it has been working exceptionally well for us thanks samit thanks for sharing this wonderful use case of yours and uh, yeah we are anyways happy to help you and also share this word with uh, stefan and luke uh, about uh, how they managed to help so thanks uh so if there is any more questions i think we already had some questions which has been answered in the chat and if there's any more questions please you can ping in the chat or reach out to us via slack or you can reach out to us via the linkedin Okay. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I think you can post it uh, in the public as well to show this demo that what you look at. So yeah, thank you all. And uh, here's our contact form, and you can scan this QR code if you want to reach out to us. And if there's any specific use case around Kikaos, Kafka, and how to use it in terms of combination, please reach out to us. And here are our contact details. And uh, yeah, you can also reach out to us personally uh, in case if you have any doubts or specific use case that you wanted to talk to us about. So thanks, Amit, for making your time and uh, joining us in this webinar. And uh, thanks, Andre, for preparing this uh, nice demos. It was really useful. So see you again on yet another webinar. Until then, see you. Bye-bye.